All right, all right. Welcome, everyone. Episode three of the Open Waters podcast. I'm not going to lie. I've recorded this intro maybe a hundred times. So this one, this one's the last one. Uh, (laughs) I'm one of your co-hosts, Connor Helm. And today we are joined by Colin Sheehan and Mark Wiggins, as well as a really, really special guest in Jack Moran. Great interview coming up. And I really hope that you guys stick around and enjoy. Um, This is going to be a, a really good episode for anyone, any young entrepreneur, someone who's, who's got that business mindset. They think, you know, they see something and they think, you know, I can, I can do it better. I can, I can make my own company. I can be my own boss. Um, and, and that's why we really wanted to bring Jack on. He's, he's a great guest. Uh, he's a great friend. And, and I think everyone's going to really enjoy it. I also wanted to take a second to, to talk about Open Waters podcast and, and, you know, we're, we're, quickly approaching the holiday. Uh, it's December 22nd today. And I just really want to say thank you to everyone who's who's been following along, watching every episode. We see you um, and, and we're listening to your feedback and, and we're really trying to change the podcast to be the best thing for all of our listeners. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and you know we're, we're really gonna build off this momentum into 2021. Uh, continue to upload weekly podcasts and, and we're just going to really push this thing forward and, and make it the best it can possibly be. So without further ado, here's Jack Moran from Ecological Improvements. All right, all right. Episode three of the Open Waters podcast. We have a special guest today, Mr. Moran, Mr. Jack Moran from Ecological Improvements, an old friend from Massachusetts Maritime Academy, played lacrosse together, uh, stayed in close connection uh, throughout our four years there. Uh, and this is actually the first time, Jack, that we've talked since we've graduated, uh, which is pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to kind of get right into it. We really want to start talking about uh, your, your experience at Mass Maritime. Then we want to kind of get into you know, what, what is ecological improvements? What did it take to get off the ground? What are you doing? What are you, what are you looking in for the future for ecological improvements? Um, and maybe just you know, some, some tips and tricks that you would have for, for a young entrepreneur like yourself uh, who maybe you know, isn't following your direct footsteps, but, but wants to start their own company, uh, whether it be a maritime back company or maritime focus company, uh, or really anything. So Jack, I want you to kind of, uh, take it away here and, uh, you know, just kind of introduce yourself and, and, and what, give us a, a brief, not, we, we can get into it a little bit, but give us an explanation about ecological improvements and, and what you're doing down there. For sure. I just want to first start by saying, I, I think it's great what you guys are doing. Uh, I wish I had a similar platform that I could have referred to when I was a student at Maritime. So props to you guys for getting this going. I, I'm sure it's going to take off here very soon. Uh, but jumping right into it, uh, essentially, you know, I was a Mass Maritime student. Uh, I studied marine safety, science, and environmental protection. So took kind of an environmental science route. Um, and I was kind of looking, you know, like everyone, freshman and sophomore year, like, you know, what am I going to do with, uh, you know, my major uh, when I get out? And I always knew in the back of my mind that I wanted to go down more of an entrepreneurial route because, you know, it's nice being able to work for yourself, right? Yeah. Um, And everyone always asks me, because I'm doing erosion control, it's a very niche job, uh, how did you get into, you know, this field? And to give you a little background, it's kind of a funny story. I was taking this class. It was called uh, Coastal Zone Management. Uh, It was with a professor named William Hubbard. Uh, I'm sure people, you know, who are listening to this know who that is. Uh, he's, he's helped me a lot get to where I am today. But when I took the class, I want to say it was second semester, sophomore year, maybe first semester, junior year. Uh, it was a pretty boring class, honestly. I, I, I wasn't, seemed like it was just, you know, a required class. I wasn't getting a ton from it. Uh, and honestly, I was falling asleep in the back of the class. And, and I always tell people, it was like, grace of God. I just woke up one day in the middle of his class and he was talking about how on Scusset Beach, there's this massive project where they have a $15 million contract open to restore their their wetland system. And really you just have to go in and do the plantings for uh, for this wetland and you you could get this massive contract. But there are no companies currently in the area that were able to take the contract and it had been open for X amount of years. So to me, a bell went off in my head. I'm like, okay, why can't I do that? You have to plant a bunch of plants. That seems pretty simple. 
So, and uh, stop me if I'm rambling, but, but uh, so I went after class and I met with him and I was like, Professor Hubbard, what would it take me to, you know, get a contract like this? Do I need to have some special licensing or what? And he was like, no, you're pretty qualified for it as a, you know, a maritime student with getting a bachelor degree. Um, but there are a, you know, a slew of laws and, you know, you need to know the horticulture in the area, blah, blah, blah. I was like, well, this is really interesting to me. I think this is a big opportunity. Give me everything that I need to know to, to understand and be able to take a contract like this in the future. And so essentially he gave me, you know, some material to start out with the clean water act, uh, some local conservation laws and just said, pick through this. And it was kind of a test to see if I, you know, if I made it through this, he'd give me the next thing. A little background on him. He was working with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, for 30 years doing giant state, state and federal projects uh, for, for erosion control, uh, coastal, coastal zone management, essentially. And so he had a, 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 a background in this for, like I said, 30 years. So he was the perfect person to get these resources from. So right away, I started digging, plugging after class and, and just, you know, getting basically a secondary education uh, on erosion control in the industry. And just to kind of uh, go off track a little bit, it's so important that while you're in school to utilize your resources and your professors, because they teach a, a you know, a, a subject and they have guidelines for that subject but all these professors came from certain professions and they're experts in their own industry. So if you see yourself like this is an interesting field that I want to go into, utilize that professor and, you know, get resources from him. Don't just take the material, you know, find, find that niche that you're interested in and expand upon it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, I 100% agree with that. And, and so was this like when you were starting to do that, um, I, I was looking on your LinkedIn and, you, and it talks about Moran, uh, the, the consulting company. Is that kind of where this all started? Is when you doing that? Not to be Ex confused with Moran Environmental Recovery, which is not the company that yeah. you started. Uh, I wish I started that, but <laughs> no, but that was where it, it, it originally started. And, you know, a point I want to make is that, you know, you constantly as an entrepreneur have to adapt. If you stay, you know, the same constantly, things are constantly changing around you. So if you're not adapting, you know, you're not keeping up with the market and you'll be left behind. So I started out as uh, when I, when he first started helping me with all this, I was getting the materials and I started learning the permitting process for these coastal, coastal projects. And so I kind of started selling a little bit uh, outside of school, finding people that had these residential projects where they might be trying to protect their property from an erosion event. And to do that, because you're in a coastal marine environment, there's a long permitting process that goes into it. So I became an expert at the permitting process of that, uh, that first year of working with this professor. And so I kind of marketed myself as, hey, I can get these permits from, from you or for you. I know how to write the permits. If you want to do the project, I can save you X amount of money going to an environmental consultant and I'll just do it. I'll charge you just hourly a very cheap rate and I'll be learning while I'm doing it. So that's where the Moran, I, well, I don't even know what it was called anymore. Moran LLC or something or Moran consulting or something. It was just like, I didn't even have the company registered, but I was just doing side work, writing the permits uh, for, it started with this guy in Wareham just outside of ca campus writing permits for him and just kind of learning. I would have to call the commission, uh, the conservation commission, uh, uh, mass DEP department Envi of environmental protection, because I didn't know what I was looking at at these forms. I knew the process, but you know, there were certain parts of the forms that I had to fill out that I'd call and I'd be like, uh, what does this even mean? And I was learning as I went. So it, it was the biggest thing for me in that, that, uh, that point in time was not how much money I was making, but how much I can learn. And another point that I want to make to anyone listening is that always work to learn, never work to make money. Because if you're passionate and, and you acquire all the skills in whatever field that you choose, the money will automatically follow. If you ch chase the money, you might, you might limit yourself 
to your opportunities that are available where you might have an opportunity that you could learn a wealth of knowledge and this company is unable to pay you this, you know, a big salary up, up front, but you're learning all these skills that are increasing your value as, as an employee and as a, a professional. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. And it's something like I, I actually uh, was presenting to uh, an accounting class. One of the, I, I went back to Maritime and just did like a virtual class. And that was one of the things that I really wanted people that were the, the students to take away from was that something that I really did wrong. And I think that a lot of uh, probably just schools in general, but very particular to Maritime, at least because just because we have the experience. Um, that, that people are really chasing that paycheck after college. And it, it seems so, it's so natural to do because you just spent, you know, I'm out of stater. So I spent like 120 grand in college. And, you know, the first thing I want to do is make that money back. And so the first thing, of course, that I look at when I was looking at jobs, uh, which is actually kind of interesting because it was a dredging company that I was working for, which is now kind of something that you're getting into a little bit, Jack, like your, I see like your Instagram videos with the, that mini dredger you guys got, which is pretty interesting. Um, but, but yeah, I think the, the first thing I did was I, I chased the paycheck. I, I had, uh, luckily had a, like two, a, three job offers when I was about to graduate because I was graduating early. So I was just in like this perfect time where companies were looking for people. Uh, and I ended up taking the, the job that just offered me the most money and in turn ended up setting myself back in my career a little bit because I ended up leaving, uh, before a whole a year was up, uh, just because it, it was not a good fit for me. The, the money was the, a great fit for me. I, I was happy with the money, but I, just the, the job in itself uh, and just the environment that I was in, I, I just didn't enjoy it as much as something that I, I am currently doing now and, and something that I love. So, and, and the money uh, did follow. <laughs> just uh, just right. the, that well, fact, the money right. followed. <laughs> and, well, um, and, oh, sorry, continue. Just out here, uh, Colin here. Um, I kind of took Jack's advice. I um, took an 18 month trainee program right after school, instead of taking that high paycheck, kind of took a little bit of a cut. But in that 18 months, I've been able to sit with every single department in the company. And then my 18 months is up right now. And I can kind of basically see where I want to go and see what best fits and just kind of soak in as much knowledge as possible. And I can uh, kind of go from there, like you're saying. Exactly. And I, you know, I'm guilty of it too. I had worked on this company for three years teaching myself the industry and becoming an expert in it. And I got an opportunity to work in finance after college. And I did that for six months, chasing that paycheck, something where I didn't want to be in an office place, but I figured, you know, if I stick around and I get good at finance, I could be making crazy money. And I realized very quickly that, you know, I'm not passionate about this. I don't like what I'm doing. So it's very hard to be successful in an era. It's very hard to be successful when you're miserable. Yeah. If you, everyone's heard the saying, if you like what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. You're to get to that next level, to be in that top five, fifth percentile or whatever it is the you know, top 5%, you know, you can't just work that 40, 40 hour week that is assigned to you. You have to put in that extra time to excel. And it's tough to put in that extra time if you're not passionate, and you don't like what you do. Right. And um, where are some of the jobs that people typically go into in your major? Because I even though I went to school there, it's still kind of blurry to me. I'm not, I don't really know too much about it. Right. There's a, I mean, I, I know I was looking a little bit into going to the environmental officer role on a cruise ship. That's more maritime industry, um, which is a good profession. Uh, it, you're capped out, which I didn't like. Uh, people will go into like uh, clean waters and doing like uh, environmental cleanups, like uh, hazardous material cleanups. Um, then there's the research side of things. So, you know, working for a company like Woods Hole Oceanographic and, and taking data, being a lab technician. So there's, there's a bunch of different routes you can go down, but there is a big, you know, big opportunity for entrepreneurs. The environmental industry is absolutely booming. It's recession proof. There's so many opportunities for people to capitalize on. So, so jumping, you know, right into a, a role as an employee, I would advise against it, but, but for some people, they like that security, but I think this is the time where you're able to take those risks when you don't have as many responsibilities. Right. Well, uh, Mark lives in Florida and I live in Norfolk, Virginia right now. And my backyard is flooding basically every night here behind my apartment building. So 
Crazy. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Miami Beach, which I don't know how long that will last. You're in Miami Beach? Yeah. Really? I, I live on Hibiscus Island. Oh, no. Really? Well, shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so do you, are you doing projects in Florida, too? Yeah, so right now I'm in Tampa. Um, right. So um, we've been here for like the past two or three months doing, doing projects. Uh, we're, we're all over Florida. We're national, so we're going, uh, well, we have projects in North Carolina. But right now, uh, Florida's our biggest market. So I live in Miami Beach. Uh, I'm there like maybe 1% <laughs> of the time. Right. right. So, yeah, so, and, uh, and co commuting up the coast, you know, it's, I, now that I think about Florida is a pretty ideal state for your, I would think for your business, because not only is it obviously the coastlines, but there's also, uh, Connor was saying that you do quite a bit of work with uh, uh, golf courses and basically the interior Florida, because it, Florida is almost a, an entire state of wetlands. So exactly. I can imagine it's pretty, pretty open market, open season for you down here. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, the, the inland erosion control, homeowners associations and golf courses, municipalities has proven to be a, a much easier route to go down. The, yeah. the coastal side of things is definitely where I want to be at eventually. Uh, but this has been a, a good stepping stone and going back full circle to where I said you have to adapt. I was an expert at coastal erosion control and I found an opportunity in inland erosion control. So I remodeled my company to be able to capitalize on that market and expand from there. So if I had just stayed with coastal erosion control, I don't know if I would be there, be here today, but I saw the opportunity, you know, through meeting the owner of Socks, I'm, I'm plugging their hat a little bit. I'm a certified service provider of their, their, uh, their system. And it's, you know, been, been an absolute blessing that, I did meet him and that we, we have found this opportunity in the in, inland restoration. Yeah, that's really cool. And the, the ocean restoration, like the, um, like the beaches and stuff like that, that's more, is that more like government contracts? Like those are high dollar, like, you know, long-term projects. I know that uh, with the last company I worked for, a lot of it was going towards, uh, or it, it was with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, like they funded most of the projects or at least some of, of the projects, some, a, part, a portion of them. Uh, right. But I mean, they were doing you know, pretty big restoration jobs on uh, like the pretty much the whole Northeast. Yeah. So there are residential jobs too. You can do residential projects, but the, the big work is those government federal contracts, the, you know, the public beaches, public and state beaches. But the issue with that is there's a very, very stringent permitting process to get the projects approved. Uh, so and it requires a lot of money. There's a lot of lobbying involved to get those projects and get those contracts. So as a small, small business, this has been a much easier stepping stone to start on those inland projects where they're private communities. They don't require that, that uh, stringent permitting process to get the, the projects pushed through. But we have now been uh, growing. I was actually just on a call today. They're working on a case study with, I want to say it's the uni uh, University of Southern Florida, maybe it is. And, and they're working on a case study applying socks to the coastline and they've seen great applications uh, in estuarine environments. So, so hopefully soon we can get into those, uh, those marine projects. But as of right now, we're doing mostly inland restoration. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and, and you're working with the, the SOX team. What, what is the, the EI, the ecological improvement? What, like what's your head count already for your company? So yeah. there's, there's four of Sorry. us right now uh, that are working as the install team. And then we have an administration. Uh, I know there's like, I want to say seven of us now that are under the, in the EI family. And they're a certified service provider of SOX. SOX is a manufacturer that manufactures the mesh that we're using that you see in a lot of the Instagrams. Uh, and we're an installer of that product. That's awesome. That's really cool. Where do you see, uh, like, you know, we I feel like now we have a pretty good idea of where you're at, you know, now two and a, what is it, two and a half, three years out, out of, uh, out of graduation. And, uh, where do you see it going in the next two, three years? Like what, what's your, what are your biggest fears and what's your, you know, what would be, what would be the number one success you can see in the next couple of years? What's that one thing that you're not hundred percent sure you're going to get to, but that's, that's your goal. That's your target that you're looking at. Well, We've been kind of on the threshold for the past two, three months of getting to that next level where we can, you know, start bringing in a substantial amount of new employees. And since we've made this partnership and we've taken on the administration, we've, we've got the backing behind us. 
January 1st that there's we're going to start getting a lot more projects we got I just was had a call today earlier today we have seven new projects coming in uh, for the new year um, they're working on a contract in California right now for over a million feet it's like a 15 year contract of socks fencing so so there's not really the, the only fear I have right now is that we can keep up with it but since partnering with uh, partnering with those other partners that cannot be mentioned uh, 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 the business is is booming yeah, no, that's awesome. I mean, having too much business is, is never an issue, right? Um, you right. Can hire more people, but you, you exactly know, not having enough business is, is where we're getting into issues. There. Exactly. Yeah. So um, one of the other things that, that I really wanted to talk about, and, and it's something because Colin and I, uh, in our group chat, we always go back and forth. We always have like these business ideas because I, I, I like to think that, that our podcast um, is kind of one of those business ideas. It was kind of just something that we, we saw that there, there was a need for something where people could, that you know graduated from Maritime Academy or are in the industry, they're young professionals, uh, they, they wanna give back, they wanna tell their story. Uh, and, and it was something that we didn't have, which we all talked about before. We, when we went to Maritime, this is something that we wanted, didn't get. Um, and so then we, we kind of just had other business ideas where we're talking about you know, like, like shipping, like coastal shipping or starting our own steamship line, like, it, like crazy ideas like that. Um, but but I, I think what's really interesting is that you had one of those crazy ideas in your head, right? And you went and you did it. Um, and and now it's not crazy. Now it's totally normal. And, and like, I, I'm sure you couldn't imagine doing anything else right now. Um, so I, I guess like the, the question uh, in that is like, how do you, how do you kind of minim not minimize the risk, but I mean, you're taking a big step. How do you make it happen? Yeah, yeah. Like how are you making it out? Because you're taking a huge step, right? You're you left a financial job. You said that you secured you secured the bag. You had the money, um, and then you were just like, you know, I'm gonna move down to Miami and I'm gonna start this company, and I'm either gonna sink or swim. So I like talk us through that. Talk us how like telling your parents, like if right. you met up to your dad, you're just like, <laughs> and dad, I'm also, gonna stay. right. <laughs> also, like some of your roadblocks that you face, some yeah. of those things that you had to overcome, you know, because I'm Absolutely. sure it's easy. Yeah, uh, uh, going back to my parents, like everyone's always going to tell you like, because times are really changing and our parents, they're, you know, used to get into a career, uh, you know, that you have good benefits and that you can stay with long term. But the, the markets, in my opinion, are changing and it's going from a time where you want to be an employee to where there's more opportunity and more value if you're able to provide jobs and you're an employer but but as as far as how to make it as an entrepreneur you, there's going to be so much sacrifice and you have to be uncomfortable you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable starting out i mean i was i was living in my car uh trap like like literally living in my car and i i was at one point sleeping in an office uh to try to make this happen and, and sleeping on an air mattress in an office. And I packed up my car and moved down to Florida to make this happen. And so there's, you have to have to sacrifice and, and making that sacrifice is what's gonna pay off in the long run. And it's, I mean, we're young, you can make that sacrifice. I mean, everyone slept on a couch before, but if you're, if you're constantly wanting to be comfortable, then, I mean, the employee, employee route is, is more up your alley especially if you're starting, you know, the grassroots way and, and you're starting from the bottom up. I know some people have like a, you know, they'll have like an investing uh, or, or someone that can invest in them or like a family that can help them out get started and they avoid those, you know, hurdles. But if you're starting grassroots from the bottom, bottom up, there's a ton of sacrifice you have to make. But as far as, you know, what really takes you to the next level and what, what helps uh, uh, the number one thing that can help you make it is it's all about who you know. So networking is, is absolutely key. And, you know, advice that I could give is may, even if you don't have a company and you see yourself, you want to, you know, you have an idea and you want to start as an entrepreneur and you want to build some business, even if you don't know what that business is, fake it till you make it. Yeah. I, I was, I was, <laughs> I, I made business cards. I was going to, I was going to conferences, uh, uh, trying to meet professionals. Originally, I was trying to start a nursery uh, to grow the Spartinas for the plants. Uh, this was after I graduated, after I'd gotten out of the consulting 
the next step, I was, I was trying to build a, a nursery where we could grow these plants. And so I went to all these conferences trying to meet people that could make this happen. And I was handing out business cards. I was acting like, you know, this was already in motion. And I met all these people, including the owner of this company. And when, when you meet those people that seem like they could be an asset to you at some point, follow up with them. So uh, Brian Fisher, the owner of Sox, I had met him. He seemed like an asset. He, he was extremely knowledgeable, seemed willing to help me. But at the time, what he was doing, he was doing the inland restorations. It had nothing to do with a nursery. But I knew that he was a, a key asset. He had been successful in his company. So I knew that I wanted to keep him as a connection. So I was following up with him at least once a month with no other topic of discussion other than just to say, hello, how are things doing? You know, I haven't seen you since the conference. You know, I hope everything's going well. And, and he loved to hear from me because I wasn't calling him just to ask for something. I was calling just genuinely to check up on him. Then a year later, when I was like, you know, I'm watching socks blow up. They're, they're installing at all these massive golf courses around, uh, around Florida. And, you know, this seems like something that I could be a part of. When I called him up and I was like, Brian, do you have any opportunity for me down in Florida? He was like, buddy, come down whenever you want. Like, we're ready to take you on. I'll show you how to bring your company to the next level. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, so, so that being said, networking is huge. And, and that's another reason why we made this podcast. Uh, it really, because we're all kind of involved in whether it be like the Propeller Club or, or certain other local you know, uh, networking clubs and stuff like that. So where we can really meet people in our industry um, again, young people, I think that's really important, but what is one thing, and, and just to wrap it up here, one thing that you could go back in time, mass maritime, you could go back and you could tell Jack Moran one thing for, that's going to help you in your future, whether it be, you know, one piece of advice or, or do this, experience this, what, what would be that thing? It doesn't have to be, have anything to do with ecological improvements. It could be, um, it probably will, but I, just, just let me know. I, I think that's an interesting question. Yeah, I would just say that I'll kind of plug this book. Uh, it's called Above the Line by Urban Meyer. Um, and it's basically just like a mindset uh, uh, book on, you know, how you should live your life. And I think the mindset of being above the line, I, a lot of times uh, being above the line is, is, you know, going that extra mile. They, they always say like Bill Belichick is someone that would go above the line. You know, he's not doing what everyone else is doing, what the 99% is doing. He's putting in those extra 10 hours to get to that next level. And in college, a lot of times, you know, I would be below the line and be doing the bare minimum to, to get by and when I could have been, you know, putting in that extra hour a day that, that would have taken me to the next level and, and accelerated, my, my, uh, ex accelerated my success and brought me that much further. So I, I would just say, you know, maximize your potential. If you know you have this much potential, don't, you know, don't sell yourself short. You never want to, you know, my biggest fear is being in my deathbed and looking back and being like, you know, I had 60 years to do all this and I, you know, I only did this. So maximize, you know, your time, do the most you can push yourself because one day you're going to look back and be like, you don't want to be like, I could have done more. Yeah, no, totally agree. And I, that speaks volumes to me just because I, I don't know out of the three of you on the call who really knew me like my freshman year at Maritime, but I had like the worst grades probably at, of anyone in our major. Um, I, I think a lot of people did. <laughs> what was that? I think a lot of people did freshman year. Yeah, yeah, I was on the verge of like dropping out, failing out. But I had a below a 2.0 my, after my freshman year. Um, and after seeing like my grades and like, and it going to different internship experiences and stuff and really just seeing like this is this is what I want to do like I'm bought I'm buying in like this is it um and then I kind of just stepped my game up from there and uh, it was a different ball game from there and I just thought it was funny because Jack you and I were like kind of in, in the same circles in in college so we, we kind of had the same uh the same mindset freshman year and it's, it's glad to see that we both kind of Got out of that yeah. mindset. And, uh, yeah, I don't have to tell you guys that I wasn't a model cadet, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, just know your worth. You guys, everyone knows what they're worth. Just go out and get it. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't. And uh, uh, before I, I don't know how much time we have left. Are we wrapping things up here? Yeah, yeah, we got only a couple minutes, two minutes. All left. right, I just want to plug a couple books that I think uh, uh, really, really helped me out. You know, 
Is that something, did you, did you read a lot when you were in college or before college, or is that something that you've, you've since found? As... I've, I've always tried to read business books. Um, but okay. now, now I constantly have audio books on when I'm working. If I just am, you know, doing miscellaneous things where I'm just like, no, doesn't require a lot of thinking. I always have an audio book on. So uh, that, that's one thing that I can tell you just having as much acquiring as much knowledge as, and skills is what's going to bring you value. So it, the mo more you can learn, the better. But, uh, but let me give you, just plug a couple books that, you know, I think are really good baseline books uh, if you want to propel your career on. Um, first one is Above the Line, the one I just said. It's kind of a mindset book. Second one is 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Leadership is not a, a difference maker. It is the difference maker. If you can lead people and influence them, it, you're always going to succeed. Um, third book is How to Win Friends and Influence People, just communication. Bill Carnegie. Books. Yep. Great communication yep. book uh, for business. Any, cause communication is everything. That's how you get to know people. That's how you make those connections. Um, Never split the difference uh, is a good negotiating, negotiating book. Cause you're always going to have to negotiate whether it's uh, when you're, you know, negotiating your salary for a job. Uh, it, it, it's very valuable uh, information. Uh, second to last one is rich dad, poor dad. Everyone knows that book. Uh, just, baseline financial literacy uh it, you have to keep your assets high and your expenses low if you want to you know become wealthy yeah which a lot of people don't know that was it that was one my first ebook i've ever actually purchased was that book i think it was one of my first business books too yeah. and the last one is i want to teach you to be rich it's taking uh rich dad poor dad to the next level it actually shows you how to allocate your money uh and what you know how to invest your money for retirement and invest in yourself essentially so those are kind of the books that I wanted to plug. Yeah, no, cool. I, I think that's awesome. I, I think those are the kind of things that maybe you, you're not getting at Maritime, even though they're just like basic books. Like I, I really wasn't interested in like doing, I, I tried to maybe a little bit, but like reading consistently um, at Maritime just because I felt like I had, I was so underwater while I was there that I wasn't going to be reading for pleasure. But um, no, that, I think that's great. It's, it's really helpful for, for um, anyone who's looking at business books or, or just educating themselves. But right. Yeah, but okay, look, let's all uh, wrap it up there. Jack, I, I really appreciate you coming on, man. I, I mean, no I, problem. I, it took too much uh, convincing to, to come on and be a part. Yeah, no, I was super excited to get on. I love what you guys are doing. Uh, I think it's great. I, I hope you guys have me on another time. Hopefully we can talk about some more uh, some more business. I wrote down like a list of things I wanted to talk about. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but yeah, and if you're listening, go follow Ecological Improvements on Instagram. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, we got tons of opportunities available for, you know, people looking for jobs. Uh, I'm going to need a ridiculous amount of employees here in the next couple yeah. months. So, yeah, so if sure. anyone wants to reach out, feel free. I'm always willing to help or, you know, ask me any questions, anything. Yeah, we'll be sure to add the, the link to all of your social media and everything to uh, the, the podcast episode as well. So right, anyway, thanks again, Jack. I really do appreciate Thank you coming on. Thank you. No problem. We'll, uh, we'll talk soon.